Hi. How are you? I'm good. I, in fact, let me put earphones, headphones on too. Okay, we'll look strange. Yeah. <laughs> From outer space. <laughs> yeah. How are you? I'm fine. I'm really fine. Yeah, How are you? Great. Yeah, yeah me you too. So me yeah? too. Yes. I'm so, so happy. Uh, <laughs> oh, finally, we could, do, we could do this. I mean, I'm so terribly happy about <coughs> this. Oh, me too, Ricardo. And it's great to see you again. And sort of strange because it's been years since we met, since wow. we actually. Yeah, right? actually. It was back, I, I don't know. Do you remember, do you recall when, when was it? You were it in San Sebastian for this exhibition for the, of the rivers? That's right. And that, no, I don't recall exactly no, I don't what it was. Exactly. <laughs> but it was many years ago. Yeah, 2013, 2012, something like that. Yeah, it should be something like that. Yeah. Well, actually, I was uh, teaching there for something like 17 years or so. And uh, this last year, I, I just quit my job because I really needed some changes, some big changes in my life. So let's see how that's it works. That's a big change. <laughs> yeah, it is a big one. Yeah. How's it going? It, it is going slowly, but wonderfully. I mean, I'm feeling terribly good and yeah. I'm imagining a new, completely different life. So I think it's going to be really, really fascinating in the, in the next years. Oh, that's wonderful. That is exciting. Yeah, it is very much. <laughs> <laughs> You are, it obviously suits you already. What? It obviously suits you already. Yeah, 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 very much. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. And I'm beginning also this series of interview with composers and with colleagues of mine who are also pianists or musicians specializing in contemporary music because I want to share so many experiences and so many views on uh, different points of view on interpretation and performance and also composing for the piano. Yeah. So I thought of you immediately because, as you know, I appreciate oh, your music you. <laughs> so, so much from so many years already. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm honored. Oh, thanks to you. So I was uh, actually beginning to try to remember when was it the first time that I came across your music and I really don't know exactly. I think it was through your walking woman. But yeah. it was so, so yeah. many years ago that I don't really remember exactly how it was. Maybe it was... Uh, through the DVD, As I, maybe I saw it somewhere. Maybe. I'm not sure myself. Yeah. I don't yeah. think I, I don't think I knew how you came into contact with my music, but yeah, I've I... always been really glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it was many yeah. years ago, and actually, uh, almost every year uh, since I was teaching in in San Sebastian, your music was uh, with me. I mean, it was perfect mm. for my students. All of them loved it too. So, mm. your working woman was uh, listened in San Sebastian almost every single year. <laughs> <laughs> and and the way you perform your working woman is so beautiful. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I think I I feel kind of a, a good connection with uh, with the music for some reason. Yeah. yeah. So we have strong connection for some, for some reason indeed. yeah yeah, yeah we our do. ears are certainly connected yeah that's it <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted maybe to start this conversation with you as you know this is going to be basically centered around uh, your piano music mm -hmm. um and i would like to maybe introduce a little bit by um, if you could explain us uh uh, what your background is in relation with the piano because as far as i know you were a pianist yourself you were trained as a pianist and uh, uh, you were in, in the 60s, in the middle of all, all these things, all these wonderful things happening. So maybe you would like to introduce us a little bit, your first, first relation with the piano. Oh, which would have started when I was small, maybe about five years old. Mm. My mother was a pianist and um, she got my both my brother, who started on violin, and, and me on piano. Um, early in our lives, thinking we'd make a duo, but we we're brother and sister, we weren't... We weren't that sort. We weren't that sort of brother and sister. I guess we never made a duo, really. But we each keep pl kept playing for quite a while, and um, eventually, this was in New Zealand in Christchurch. Um, I went through undergrad school in Canterbury, um, graduating in music, and then went over to the Royal College of Music in London on a dual scholarship. Um, as a piano student and as a composition student. Mm, both. And yeah, but with my own emphasis, my sense of my emphasis or primary focus being composition. Mm. Uh, and I, I was very lucky. I studied with a, a super fine musician and pianist, E. Kendall 
Taylor, I studied piano with Kendall Taylor and learned a lot uh, about oh, shaping, phrasing, musical interpretation from him. Was he um, open to contemporary music? Not particularly, but he was certainly not, uh, I mean, he was accepting of it. Uh, it wasn't his area, but he was perfectly accepting of it. And I was studying composition with Peter Racine Fricker, a British composer, a very fine composer. Went over to Darmstadt a couple of times to the mm. summer school in 61 and 62, which really opened <laughs> opened my mind wonderfully. My and then spent a, <laughs> and then And then I went over to uh, Köln and spent a year studying electronic music primarily with Koenig mm. um, just before he went to Utrecht. Yeah. And although I played the piano for some, a few years after that, um, I didn't make it my, my profession um, and drifted away from it. Mm -hmm. Then because in, it, was it because you had it very clear that you wanted to pursue a, a career in composition? Or? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, composition was really my passion. And I felt as if I couldn't split my energies mm. um, to my regret because my friends who are superb performers as well as composers uh, that that um, that very natural combination seems to me the quintessence of being a musician so but for me it felt as if I just couldn't so so divide my energies as I said and composition was really what I most wanted to do was most engaged in yeah you, so you know you, you know a little confession of mine it was the same case for me but just the opposite I mean I was also into composition I really loved yeah. it but yeah. at a certain point it happened to me the same thing but just the reverse I mean I <laughs> <laughs> oh that's I like that <laughs> that's lovely <laughs> very nice crossing of stories <laughs> yes indeed. yeah I love the piano too And, mm. and regret that I've lost all my technique long ago. Mm. Um, then, then in the 60s, in the late 60s, um, as it were, I happened to need to burn a, an old piano. <laughs> I yeah, needed to, yeah. <laughs> right? Very famous story of yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I always started by saying a piano, burned two pianos initially, one in the afternoon of, um, and one in the evening at a festival and on the Chelsea Embankment in London because I wanted to record fire or something which would make really tremendous sounds when burning and um, the pianos had to be completely beyond repair which isn't to say that they were physically I mean visually falling apart yeah. but that the mechanisms were beyond repair yeah. um, That's that's essential. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> bring myself to burn a functioning piano. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and that was the piano transplant. Yeah, I, it, it, it's funny that because when I show this to my students, uh, they open their eyes like crazy and think that you are like <laughs> coming from another world. And when I try, <laughs> yeah, mad woman. <laughs> Or um, since they know a little bit maybe about the flux, fluxus movement and all these things, they maybe think there's some relation with, uh, with that. And then I explain yeah. to them that it has no relation at all. And actually, it's kind of a poetic act, uh, if I if I'm not wrong. <laughs> and. Um, For some reason, it connects so much also with uh, with our culture because we he, we have here in the east co coast of Spain, in the south east coast of, of Spain, we have something called fallas, which is uh, something that they build for one enti entire year. They make uh, works of art out of yeah. cardboard. cardboard. Uh, it, it will uh, be uh, like a uh, hundred meters, a uh, hundred uh, feet long uh -huh. so wow. very huge. huge yeah yeah all the year building this kind of structures beautifully yeah. colored and everything and on the 24th of june they just burned it so <laughs> i can I, th i think uh, i kind of connect with that i mean i know what it is <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, a, it's a kind of a feast of sound of fire of yeah. beauty And also of reflection, because when you look to the fire and it's just something so, so fascinating. So I kind of connect with that. Ah, uh, and they are beautiful to watch. Yeah, I can imagine. That was, that was the second piano transplant. The first one isn't so much known about, but it, it resides at Goldsmiths College, London. I, Brilliant. Before I did the piano burning, um, 
in a slow creative period, I decided Cage hadn't been able to permanently prepare any of the pianos he worked on. He always oh, had yeah. to res- restore them to you know, the condition pro before he worked on them. Yeah. So what would it have been like had he been able to permanently prepare them? And I set about wow. permanently preparing a little piano, a little uh, upright. Um, and is it still prepared nowadays? It still exists. I, get, I, I did all sorts of things with it. I can send you some images. Wow, um, I would love to. Uh, oh, that was great fun. Uh, there are two little doll's eyes with eyelids and eyelashes which move when... Um, the mechanism is triggered, and you trigger the mechanism by trilling up in the set, you know, second from top octave of the instrument. Wow! Um, it blows bubbles through a mouth that I carved in the side that John, which, and an apparatus that John Lifton, the English artist, made for me. All sorts of things in that piano. So that was the first one. Wow! And then I, I would love to see images burning. of that. I never saw images of this. I think. Yeah, I'll send them to you. I think you'll like yeah. them. Very colorful. Yeah, yeah I can, can imagine. <laughs> Beautiful. And then we, I put pianos in the garden of Ing- at Ingotstone, where I was living in Essex at the time. Mm-hmm. And more recently, that was re- recreated by the Soundlands organization in Northern Wales in the Gwydia Forest. And I can send you an image of a, mm. a, little, gra- a little upright um, which is slowly decomposing in the forest. Wow. They send me images every now and then. They have a, wow. a motion-triggered camera near the <laughs> site, so it picks up all sorts of pictures. <laughs> so beautiful. And I've seen also a beautiful image of yours in a beach. I don't know where exactly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that It's southern exposure or eastern exposure or oh, yeah. northern exposure, depending on the orientation of the beach where it's done. And the first one was done in Fremantle, Australia, mm-hmm. near Perth. Uh, it's a little grand, which a wonderful pianist and reviver of a rescuer of pianos, Ross Bolliter, mm-hmm. found for a festival in Perth. And we set it up on the beach and oh, all sorts of stories about that one. There's a long shaggy dog story about that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm amazed also that it, nowadays it still is one of your most famous uh, works, compositions or ideas <laughs> relating okay. creation. I mean, it's uh, just so fascinating. <laughs> that and, and I find the rivers and I like it. Yeah, rivers too. It's essentially, it's as most people encounter these things, on the one hand it's fire and on the other hand it's water, so they balance. Wow, it's true, it's true. <laughs> and what relation does a piano transplant have maybe with uh, this period in, in your life when you had a knowledge of uh, Morton Feldman, I think you all, uh, you even played with him, or mm-hmm. you knew about your cage or La Bondian, what relation does it have with all this period? <laughs> I oh Cage Cage became a um a tremendous source of inspiration and encouragement. I mean I read him, I met him on and off, didn't know him well, but he was always mm. encouraging. Beautiful man, Cage. Played some of his music not well, but <laughs> really dug into it. Um loved his ideas totally Uh, felt at home with his ideas Um, I played just a little bit with uh, um, Morton Feldman which was a great experience a great experience in patience we were doing the forehand uh, or and two two piano pieces many of which are soft right Mm. Um, so it was all about touch but also all about patience and he was one of the people of several from whom I learned to to just track the progression of a sound from its start all the way through to its yeah. eventual fade out, mm. uh, which I love to do and is still very much a part of my music. And um, yeah, the sense that sounds have their own lives. Mm. And you have to let them live those lives. <laughs> Part of that is letting yeah. them fully exist and complete their, yeah, their it's, cycle. It's a, it's a good training for this to play playing the music of Motor Film and exactly for this reason, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So it was it was a very good education. Mm-hmm. Lamont really? Young, oh just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> As to everybody. 
in in 61 when the first year I went to the Darmstadt summer school I encountered Lamont doing his furniture music and at that point he was pushing a table around a room and the sounds were wonderful and people were just <laughs> oh, <laughs> astounded and I loved that too so <laughs> so Lamont just opened things up for me all these all these all these encounters opened things up wonderfully for me. I was super lucky. Mm -hmm. And um, this was actually your first approach to the piano. Then you, it was like many years after that, that your first uh, real, uh, real piano work, the concert piano work appeared. It was like in 93 or something like that. I think it's, it's actually, 93. Um, that was when it was published by White Theater Press it, in New Zealand. It's it from 88, 88 uh, 88 to 89. Oh. Yeah. yeah. In so, 1988, I, I went to uh, the Painted Desert, which is where Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and one other state all meet. Uh, it's an area of mesas and, and deserts and the Anasazi, beautiful Anasazi dwellings and so on, and spent two weeks wandering around there. And when I came back from that and, in, and eventually got back to New York that year, um, Ma Max Lifshitz had asked me, a pianist, a very good pianist and composer based in New York, asked me if I'd be interested in writing a piano piece. And it was the furthest thing from my mind by then. <laughs> I've been wow. doing so much uh, very different work and hadn't, I hadn't really written for instruments until a couple of years before that, working on a piece wow. with Tom Buckner. But other than that, I hadn't been writing for instruments for, for, mm, a well over a decade. Wow. So I thought, um, it's good to take a challenge. <laughs> and, and this appeared, presented itself as a challenge conceptually and in other ways. On the other hand, it was just lovely to, to lay my hands on the instrument again and, and conjure up sound. And I mean, and, I, I, and you succeed. It's a truly beautiful piece of music. We are talking about Red Mesa, which is Mania's first piano piece. And it's a truly wonderful piano piece that many, many pianists around the world are, are playing nowadays. You, you may find different oh, recordings you. on the YouTube. Yeah. Yes, I love, I love to, to listen to people, people's different in visions of, of that piece. Mm -hmm. those, it starts with, those, with very high B-flat harmonics, right? And for me, they conjure up a sense of suspension that the atmosphere of the that desert area created for me yeah. this marvelous clarity of the air the the quietness the way the geometric way the mesas rise up out of these flat surfaces mm -hmm. um, because red mesa is a uh, this kind of mountain that has yeah this a side. flat topped mountain flat top yeah mm -hmm. yes um, there's a black mesa, which is which is well known. I don't know that there is one called red mesa, but for me, they were that color and and those shapes were absolutely. Um, in, that was the embodiment of the feeling of that mm -hmm. area. So those B flats are that sort of atmospheric suspension, and then yeah. it it's a mesmerizing beginning. There the mesmerizing beginning of a piece. I mean, it's truly, truly beautiful. Actually, when I heard it for the first time, it reminded me immediately of uh, Sounds of the Desert. I mean, something that doesn't yeah. move at all, just yeah. keeps still for a long, yeah. long period of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it changes at really, at the very end of the piece, everything changes so much and you build a big climax of the piece, but it, it is just at the end of the piece. <laughs> and so then you, you have like 10 minutes or of just stillness, quietness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece it is. And I, I suppose this piece was um, um, asked from a pianist that was not into uh, experimental music maybe because it has just tiny bits of uh, some things outside of the kids. Of the uh, he was he was very much into contemporary music. Max uh, runs an organization which presents performances of contemporary music but in terms of the piano he wasn't particularly into he wasn't really into um, working much in, inside the piano at least at that point or wasn't particularly enthusiastic about that. Um, which I knew, but I can't stay out of the inside of the piano. <laughs> You're doing right. <laughs> so it crept in. <laughs> I, I, 
and you managed to to, uh, to to let him use a table tennis uh, ball inside of a string. Uh, yeah, yeah. Put a little rosin on it, and it, wow. it works nicely. <laughs> yeah, it works nicely. It's amazing sound, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds to me almost like a hawk's cry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or a bird of prey. Yeah. And you so, can see them wheeling above the desert and those wonderful wide arcs. They mm. fly when they're riding your thermals. <laughs> Beautiful and to a, see them. It's a sound that doesn't appear immediately. I mean, it, it doesn't work at the, for the, at the first time when you try it. Uh, with That's a, right. with a, so you have to really be patient with it and maybe yeah. rust in a little bit and then That's it works. Right. And then, then you have to works. persuade it to work. Yeah, as, yeah. Many, as many of the sounds inside of, of the instrument, yeah. Yeah, yeah, always. Yeah, the, you have to be working with it, with the, with the instrument, right? You mm -hmm. have to allow it to warm up and the strings to warm up. And yeah, you're working with, no. That's um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then some years also elapsed until, if I'm right, 1996, when you wrote your masterpiece of piano. This <laughs> is that so many pianists around the world have played and will play for sure, because it's something truly original. We are talking about your working woman. And maybe you would, you would like to introduce a little bit how this composition came about. It's the pianists who play it who make that piece, like yourself, <laughs> your working woman. Lois Spard, um, a, f a terrific American pianist specializing in contemporary music, truly contemporary music, um, asked me to write a piece for her. And uh, I said, OK, can we do it inside the piano as much as outside? And <laughs> she was all for it. So I visited her. We got to know each other. Um, I dived into my really funky little piano, which is now so untuned, impossible to to work on and so out of tune that I can't even use it for composing. <laughs> At that point, it was still absolutely usable. And I dived into that piano and I always have a lot of objects, all sorts of objects, just objects I think might make good sound mm. sitting on shelves in the room where the piano is. So I just go over to a shelf, pick something up and see what I could produce with it. I had also, by then, I, I had met Scott Robinson, E. Scott Robinson, who's a very fine percussionist, and he had taught me how to make Super Bowl mallets. Hmm. Um, and once I applied Super Bowl mallets to piano strings, I was gone. <laughs> it was yeah, it's something so amazing. <laughs> Beautiful, no? But yeah, the is. tricky thing is they work superbly on my funky little piano because the strings were slightly oxidized at that That's point. It. They're very oxidized yeah. by now. <laughs> yeah. The more oxidized, the better it works. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. <laughs> exactly, which is sort of crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because um, in, in new pianos, you just try it and it doesn't sound anything. I mean, it, no yeah. sound can come out of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's almost as if I should find an, an alter sound for it, you know, an, an alternative sound, but I can't bend my mind around to that somehow. Um, so I wanted, yeah, Ear Walking Woman, I wanted to leave a lot of room for it to be a personal piece. 
for the pianist in the sense that you have these sounds I suggest you um, explore. You, you have little phrases, right, which you perform in which I'm organizing the sounds in a certain sequence. But then I just say, explore these sounds and see what you can find, what further wonderful sounds you can find with this tool applied this way to the piano uh, interior and and set the pianist exploring. And those are very, uh, that's very personal exploration, right? It all depends on your own proclivities, your ears, the way you like to move your hands and your body. And what do you, what would you say? Yeah, well, actually, the first thing that I want to say about it is that it is not so common nowadays that a composer gives so much freedom for, uh, for, a, for, a, for a performer to play his or her music. And this is something that I truly appreciate. I mean, I appreciate it because uh, it works. I mean, if it wouldn't work, I mean, if it, anybody could do whatever and the piece would be different every yeah. time, maybe I would not be so interested. But in this right. case, I mean, a working woman is always the same work. You recognize it immediately when, it, when you listen to it whoever is playing but of course you have so much freedom inside that it's kind of a uh, magic how is she doing this i mean of course you are controlling you are controlling the structure of the piece you are presenting the materials but the fascinating thing about it is that you let the performer navigate uh, with some freedom inside of it and this is so beautiful experience because you feel this freedom and and in contemporary music, you are, we are so used to have everything so extremely fixed to the <laughs> smallest details. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes it's tr truly crazy. I mean, yeah. some scores are yeah, just a nightmare to read. Yeah. So when you find works that work and that have some freedom inside of it, I mean, it's just a wonder. So I truly appreciate this aspect of your music. Oh, thank you. Well, I came to it from the experience of having written just such an extremely fixed score when I was in my early 20s, which is the right time, at which, the natural time at which to be defining exactly what you want wow. to happen, right? And what, hap and what happened it? Was, it, it was, it ne always needed more rehearsal than it could ever possibly <laughs> conceivably get. <laughs> yeah. And even then, I, I realized I was constraining a players to replicate something with great precision which was impossible to replicate. Uh, some of the gestures, the, that was an instrumental uh, voice and instrumental piece, baritone and, and, and sextet. And uh, those gestures, some of those instrumental gestures, when I first conceived of them, could never sound like that, never, could never be produced that way. So what was the point of being so super specific, you know? Yeah. So that was one of the, one of the, um, one of the, true the, impulses or the the uh, yeah the impulses which led me away from hyper specific scores uh, wow. at that point but also i love working with performers you 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 are you have so much to give and so many wonderful ideas and absolutely beautiful ways of making and working with sound uh, why would i want to fun just tell you what to do what it's it's so much more satisfying to see what you're inclined to do, where your inclinations go, and and to make it clear that we both our domains are not separate; they're totally integrated. Yes, yeah. you are a com performer composer, and I'm a used to be a composer performer. <laughs> we're, we're totally integrated in, in making a making a piece. I completely agree with that with that vision for sure. And um, you also mentioned that you composed this piece especially for her, for Luis. Mm -hmm. And and we will talk afterwards about another piece of yours that was composed also for another performer. And um, I have seen also that you have uh, repeated this process of composing or working together with some specific uh, performers. Uh, when you first imagined uh, releasing this Ear Walking Woman piece, did you imagine that many performers around would be interested in the piece and would take the would take it as as theirs? I hoped so. Mm -hmm. It was it was an, it was Lois's idea to make it make a DVD, uh, which could be used as a teaching tool. Mm. Uh, oh, but she was an excellent teacher, 
teaching herself and had been for a long time at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. Terrific teacher. And, and it was natural for her to think of it as a potential teaching tool. So she assembled the videographer, you know, the, uh, or everything that was needed to make the video and um, liked the idea. We both liked very much the idea of recording two different takes purely audio takes um of the piece so the, like two versions it, yeah two versions to mm. make it clear that it can have many versions um and that went, and then she found herself in the in the tricky position of distrib being a distributor also which I mean, <laughs> there's never enough time to teach yeah. to perform to learn new work to distribute a, a dvd I mean, yeah 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 but, i know about but, it too yeah i bet you do but but at the moment i mean distribution online is so so much the natural uh, resource um, which it wasn't then um yeah but she did a, a beautiful job of, of yeah, it's a beautiful it recording and a beautiful and, DVD, yeah. actually wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we will put the, the link. To, I, I think it's possible still to get it. So I will put the, yeah. the link to, for people to buy because it's... they can get it from me, actually. Lois ah, yeah, gave okay. me all the remaining okay. copies. I'm happy to send it to people. Wow, fantastic. So we will we will do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And when there are so many things that I really like about this piece and about the way it is written down, one of them is the score. I mean, it's a gorgeous score. It is beautiful to see, and it's extremely detailed also in the way uh, you sp you specify all the preparations, how to build everything, how do you uh, extract the wire from the inside of the of the um, how do you say it in English of the insulation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. also how to insert the the coins inside of, a, of yeah. the strings. I mean, everything is so clearly sp specified in the score. And this is wonderful that you did it with so much care and with so much detail. I, even there, there is a, like an image of the key, the complete key from yeah. the beginning until the yeah. end and also the string and all the names of the different parts on, yeah. the, on yeah. the length of I've, it. So everything is so very clear. I found that diagram in the library of my university. Ah, yeah. just what I needed. <laughs> but <laughs> you must have found trying it on different pianos that nevertheless, such specificity has pit holes, right? And pitfalls, and you have to adapt. That's it. Which, which strings you prepare to get the tones for the little cage, mm. uh, what I think of as the, as the cage section, um, and which exactly which strings will be successful if you want to do insert as screw preparations right it changes yeah. from piano to piano yeah it is it changes a lot yeah yeah but once you have the mentality that uh, not everything inside of a piano is fixed then you, yeah. it's wonderful that it's very detailed because you know that if it doesn't work in this note it will work in another one or you, you yeah. just try another one yeah. but you yeah. know exactly what, what you want because it's so very clearly specified yeah. in the score so this yeah. is a very important thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I have so beautiful memories of um, uh -huh. many different students working on this piece and it's so, so fascinating. I remember the first of one, uh, I, I think I sent you the, the video recording of uh, Nayara yes, Hulko. Yes, you did. I yeah, was yeah, so did, thrilled yeah. to get it. Yeah, and because to hear uh, a student playing it was yeah, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. I think this was, a, this was this was the first time that a student of mine played this this piece, yeah. and she played it yeah. wonderfully from oh, uh, from memory also. And we we did this beautiful My video word. recording. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, it was a fantastic recording. Yeah, that's a beautiful recording. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have it, of course, still. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and I remember clearly as if it was yesterday that she came to 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 the class with a uh, with a box, a beautiful box that she bought somewhere and inside of the box there were all these objects and she was just Ooh. taking out uh, the stone and the serve balls and everything it was oh. beautiful i mean something that i will remember oh, a ritual <laughs> yeah kind of a ritual yeah, yeah lovely lovely uh, yes it is yeah, i feel and very lucky that you've taken the piece up i really do and, it, and every time that I take, again, the piece is a new, a new experience because one of the things that you learn over working with, with a piece over time is that you have to let some freedom also to the performer in the same, in the same way that you have uh, let us get freedom. I, as a teacher, have to let 
some freedom to the to the to the student and yeah. this is kind of challenging for me because i have my own ideas about it about a piece but i always yeah. try to position myself on okay this is her or his vision about a piece and it may be something different to mine and uh, lo wonderful uh, things have wow. happened because i just let him or her just go it's uh, his own direction <laughs> and something oh. new happens completely that i didn't imagine myself so Every time I work on it, it's a new discovery. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. It makes it sound like a box from which things keep flying out in all directions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thinking of boxes. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Another idea also that I like so much about the piece is this idea of, uh, of exploration. Maybe we can talk a little bit about it because, um, I mean, free exploration of the inside of the piano. Because you allow the performer to departing from certain aspects or certain um, sounds that you imagine in your head you allow to, the, the performer to explore a little bit as if he was or she was uh, walking in the woods or in yeah. a garden or something like that this is a beautiful idea hmm. yes yes exploring is it comes from the glass concerts really from my experience with the glass in which i knew how i wanted to uh, get each sound sequence rolling, so to speak, to set the glass vibrating. But then I could never be sure exactly how it would unfold, you know, and um, depending on the intensity with which the energy would build up in the glass and, thing and things like that, um, somehow, sometimes the sounds would totally astonish me and move in directions, as it were, de tiny fine details, directions which I never would have anticipated. So the glass could could always astonish me, and mm -hmm. it was and it felt like exploring. Yeah. Um, and and I love that. I love performances exploration. It was it was exciting always. It was it was unpredictable. I loved I loved it also that it felt as if the material took over, mm. and it wasn't that I was fully controlling material, but the material had its own inclination, so to speak, and its own physics, and the material could take over. So also in Ear Walking Woman, the piano can take over. Hmm. And by by exploring with these tools on various parts of the piano, you can never quite predict how the energy will build up in a strut and what will result from that, and the strut takes over accordingly. Yep. So it's a I... collaboration with the instrument. Too. Yeah, <laughs> and I have found also sometimes that, um, in, and I have to, uh, heard you talk about this, that sometimes things happen inside of a, of, a, of a piece that some error may happen, and you kind of allow this error to sure. transform itself into a different thing inside of a piece, which is a sure. beautiful idea too. Yeah, hmm. those, those things which present themselves as... Um, not in the realm of the piece, so to speak, mm. initially, can be great, can mm. be great, can really take a piece in, in different directions. It used to, a lot of us who work in studios, uh, worked in the analog studios, used to know that experience very well. When you set up a patch and the interactions of the various modules would suddenly surprise you. I mean, move in a direction you wouldn't have expected mm. um, or produce a, a glitch, what we might have initially called a glitch. And then if you listened, really listened to it, it was fascinating material. And then you sort of went off in that direction. Glitches were great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, there didn't seem to be any such thing as an error. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, one thing that happened to me many times while playing this piece, uh, just to introduce a little bit for those of you that no, do not know about this piece yet, uh, it is amplified. And one of the, of the materials that Anya asks the, asks the performer is a, a, a bubble wrap that uh, she positions on the on the top of uh, bass bass strings and it bounces a, a lot when when you just action one string it bounces a lot and it produces a magic sound truly magic sound and since this is picked up by a microphone and transmitted out to a speaker it produces the most amazing sound, really, <laughs> truly, truly uh, fantastic. And it has happened a lot of times to me that people come at words and ask me how I, how did I do that with a microphone? Because uh, it was something, of course, electronic. And how did I do that? And I explained that it was nothing electronic, <laughs> just a bubble wrap like this. <laughs> and they are like, 
like amazed because it <laughs> couldn't be possible. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it, it's happened to me. That like, is an uh, amazing sound, times. isn't it? It's isn't so, that so great. It's like such a simple material, yeah. everyday material. How, yeah. how did you imagine that? <laughs> I just tried it, tried putting. It, I knew they would. It would bounce. I wanted yeah. to see how much it would bounce. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that in my workshops, I uh, when I introduce your piece, your working woman, I begin many times with this. Like, uh, if I position this on the bass strings, what do, what do, you, what do you imagine it will sound like? And people begin looking at each other and do not really imagine and have an idea about how do we, it will work out. And they are truly surprised when it when it yeah. comes to this amazing yeah. sound. I also wanted to ask you about one thing um, in, relation, in relation also to the glass concert mm -hmm. because um, I think, I'm not sure about this because I haven't seen the score but I think there is a score of a glass pieces and mm -hmm. I think maybe there is a kind of relation between the score of your working woman and the score of uh, glass pieces, could it be? Not really. Um, the glass concerts, uh, I, I wrote out a score as text mm. um, for Source, Music of the Avant-Garde magazine a wonderful magazine that was being published out of uh, San Diego at that point mm. uh, by Larry Austin and Stan Lunetta and and Art Woodbury and in any case I sent them the score of Glass Concert uh, illustrated with many many photographs uh, of the various glass materials forms of glass and how I played them and these um, quite detailed texts uh, one for each sound source and sound event and um, a duration gave each event a duration which I did in performance too one had to have some sort of uh, fluid uh, fluent not fluid but fluent structure from which to with which to perform and every now and then there'd be a little graphic diagram but they weren't needed very often uh, whereas Earwalking Woman is really a graphic score I love I love using graphics for scores actually um, I used to love it when in the 70s, in the late 60s, people started creating graphic scores and they got super elaborate, right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, Hobbs so Shop Ramati's scores. Mm. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Mm. Um, anyway, I loved the idea of graphics for scores and so Ear Walking Woman turned into a graphic score and I have a snare drum piece called Amazonia Dreaming for snare drum and voice, which is also mm. graphic. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different ways to express a score, mm. uh, but glass concert was text, primarily yeah. text and photographs. Yes, uh, because in my channel, not many people will be uh, will know what the glass concerts are. Maybe you will just explain t a tiny bit what was it that experience. Sure. Um, I won't go into how they started, but what they were uh, were two-hour evenings of sound made with glass and my reason for choosing glass was that I figured that's a highly resonant material which hasn't been much explored musically beyond the the wine glass 
instruments which Mozart knew and wrote for and many of his contemporaries beyond the, those beautiful little instruments, not much explored. Um, and I figured, and I wanted to present people with the idea that any one sound is actually super intricate, um, has as many elements, uh, has is, contains within it many, many elements which interact in the most interesting ways, but we don't really get a chance to hear them because we, we juxtapose sounds with one another, we combine them, we play them off each other. It's, it goes back to the idea of sounds having their own life and letting that life unfold so you can track it. So I wanted to, to present people with one sound event at a time hmm. um, and, and just suggest there's an interior structure here that's really is a beautiful musical composition in itself. Uh, so I needed a material that they couldn't identify <laughs> uh, so that their ears and brains would be really focused on the sound. They would really have to crawl inside that sound. Mm. Um, because when, once you hear a sound which you can identify, it's easy to dismiss it and let it just become part of the general sonic environment and pay no more attention to it. If you can't identify it, you become preoccupied with... Yeah, what would it <laughs> Yeah, right. And so you have to keep listening. <laughs> Um, that's why glass became the material. And then um, my partner at the time, Harvey Matuso, just, uh, thought that we might approach the glass monopoly, manufacturing monopoly, Pilkingtons in England mm -hmm. and see if we could interest them. And they were very interested. Wow. And I, I would just make trips to the Pilkingtons factories and go through their slag heaps, you know, the discarded glass. Uh, go through all their manufacturing processes and they would just give me anything that I was interested in working with um, wow. and eventually made me most beautiful wooden cases for transporting the the whole glass concert because wow. uh, I, I took it to Australasia and Scandinavia and so on. And then I made this whole two-hour work with it which started in complete total theatrical blackout, not even exit lights. So mm. you really were using only one sense, your hearing, mm. wow. um, really focused for half an hour. And then light would come up on a stage which was full of uh, sort of not sculptures in the sense of having been especially made for me, but a huge uh, glass mobile. I think the biggest pane was about six foot by six foot wow. and two, three long curtains of glass. Um, gla the the uh, hollow glass rods which were maybe as much as three feet long which swished like the curtains you push through when you go into a shop in the summertime right just curtains of beads that idea so you walk through a corridor of these long glass tubes and they would swish against each other with the most beautiful sounds and you know, all sorts of things How many pieces of glass could it be in one of these concerts? I've never thought about that. But many. Many, many, yes. Wow. <laughs> and initially, sure, we broke glass. and, and Yeah, I can imagine. But, but that got boring very fast. I mean, yeah. <laughs> glass breaking isn't nearly as interesting as glass vibrating. So I, I, before long, I just kicked out all the events which in which glass was broken, which were not so many. And, hmm. and, and then... Practically never was any glass broken after that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be. You just track the intensity of vibration and slacken off a bit when you feel that the intensity is too much for the material. And mm. you get very sensitive to the energy level of the material. I like that. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, yeah. I, I, listening to you, I found like um, a connection also with your working woman yeah. uh, with everything you were explaining because in your working woman you have all these uh, different sections of the piece where you just use maybe one two or three materials but with little sounds i mean for instance the moment with the stones where you have yeah. these rounded stones uh, egg like um, no. And then you move them on the str of the strings or between the prepared strings and the non-prepared strings, and these are really tiny, tiny sounds. But if you are hearing really inside of a piano or with a microphone, you hear so many harmonics, high harmonics, and it's wonderful. I mean, this passage is just magic. Or for instance, the passage at, at the end where you have this gamelan sound with the, with yeah. the coins, 
It yeah. is, it's, it's just that. I mean, it's nothing more than that, but it's so full of, of richness in the sound. So I find a connection with that that you were explaining with the, with the glass. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> There's a direct line from the glass concerts to Ear Walking Woman. Wonderful. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then again, we have like uh, some years also until the next piece comes. And this is a very short one. This is the shortest piece that you have written, I, I think, for piano, which is called RCSC. And maybe you would like to tell us a little bit about the origin of this piece. It's the shortest of all my pieces. Yeah. And oh, the really? one I composed fastest. It only took me two weeks. I couldn't believe it. Wow. <laughs> wow. I normally take much longer than that. Yeah. RCSC. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Cahill, another fine American pianist who specializes in contemporary music. Yeah. <laughs> um, lovely, lovely person uh, of whom I'm very fond. Sarah uh, commissioned seven women composers to write short pieces uh, in some way connected with Ruth Crawford, uh, sometimes known as, by her married name, Ruth Crawford Seeger, who was an, is a really important um, composer, ex experimentalist uh, from the 1930s and early 40s and before and then she lived longer than that and moved into a, a somewhat different realm of of, tradi of conserving traditional musics um, mm. under her husband's influence charles yeah. seeger but um, her own compositions are wonderfully strong rigorous uh, beautifully conceived and, and i particularly love her second string quartet um, the last movement of which is a 10 note row mm -hmm. and it's permutations and that's a particularly beautiful final movement. Um, so when Sarah asked me to do a piece focused around Crawford's work, I immediately thought of that quartet and that movement and decided to take the 10, her row, transpose it. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than working with it uh, through the permutational methods that she used, just freely use it um so it has it has one really restrained for me one interior piano sound right towards the end <laughs> i that was so <laughs> magic <laughs> <laughs> i was i was writing it at the jurassi ranch which is a an artist residency in the hills up in the hills in california and walking on the ranch one day on one of the dirt roads i came across uh, it's called here a wheel lug, the um, the screw attachment with which you screw wheels on. So it's sort of critical. <laughs> and this <laughs> but they're always you falling know, off. <laughs> you, you know how difficult it is to find such a thing? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. I do. I mean, okay, I'm, thank you. <laughs> I'm terrible at doing this, right? Finding very specific objects. And then I compel the performers to find them too. Which is... No, it was just so fun. I mean, it was really fun. <laughs> You found one. Yeah, I found you one. Found. <laughs> I just found found a cup. Actually, I bought six of them at the, you know, making the most of the opportunity for an English pianist who I just sent the piece to. Anyway, so I found this wheel lug on the road and mm. it has this rounded chrome plated end. So a very smooth rounded end mm. and it has weight to it. Yeah. That's uh, important, which, is, which is really important. A spoon will not do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I took it back to the, my studio and tried it out on the piano strings. And I loved it. It's a different sort of glissando hmm. from just doing it with your fingernail or a coin. Hmm. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the weight makes a difference, I think. And the, and the, the widths of the lug, all these little details make a yeah. critical difference. So yeah. that comes in towards the end of the piece. <laughs> the name RCSC is a combination of their names because I realized that their names form almost a palindrome. <laughs> Ruth Crawford, uh, Ruth Crawford Seeger and Sarah Cahill. So I conflated the names. Yeah. And so actually, when I discovered this piece of yours, uh, I was into Ruth Crawford's music because uh, ah. for some for some months I, I had already known about the preludes that she wrote yeah. for piano, oh, and I was superb. completely fascinated yeah. by this music. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. mas a master composer. I have yes, played really. uh, 
the her plays her plays many times and i will recall them for sure i mean it's wonderful <laughs> wonderful music yeah from the beginning to the end of of all the preludes yeah oh when you when you record them i want that recording yeah <laughs> for sure I will, I will send it to you yeah yeah i I'm, love your playing to do it. i love her work those preludes is a wonderful piece it's interesting yeah, they're fascinating pieces. fascinating and they are yeah. so passionate i mean i yeah. really love this energy this wonderful yeah. energy that she has I'm yeah, so wonderful. glad to hear you're playing them. That's yeah. wonderful news. <laughs> I will let you know, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, next year you write another very personal piece with piano, which is called well I I I don't cannot uh, speak in French, but it was something like Cécile Nepal piano. Yes, it's the after writer. the Magritte Cécile Nepal. That's it. Very famous <laughs> right. painting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But the same with a piano. And again, it happens as a, it, it was with uh, your working woman that you work in collaboration with our performer, and you write a piece I think in design specifically for this person. And it has some traces that make make it so that this is a piece mainly intended for this person. But again, it happened uh, again the same story that a lot of pianists, I suppose, approached you interested in this piece because it's a truly different experience of uh, playing the piano, and were interested also in doing their own approach to this piece. So maybe just tell some stories about it. Sure, Jennifer Heimer. Her, who lives in Hamburg and is an American pianist, again, a contemporary music pianist and and activist and presenter, live wire. Jennifer does all sorts of amazing things. Um, we'd known each other for quite a while. Um, and she, when she asked me to do a piano piece for her, and it occurred to me, I mean, I felt as if I wanted to make it a truly personal piece. And it got really personal. I I asked her to record um, her feelings about her hands. And that's about as personal as you can get with a pianist, right? Um, and her feelings about pianos she owned or had owned. And she was up for it, bless her, and recorded a very moving recorded herself uh, recounting a beautiful um, and moving uh, memories and thoughts about her her hands, her grandmother's hands, her mother's hands. Uh, arthritis runs in the family, so it's a, 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 a poignant, uh, it's a poignant thing to be thinking about. And some wonderful, funny stories about her pianos and how her kids are always surprised to anymore to encounter a piano that doesn't have little stickers on the on the hammers to <laughs> remind you which hammer is which note, <laughs> right? Any prepared piano pianist knows those. Yeah. Um, and I I wanted to make it a sort of duet, so in a way between us. So I she wanted it to be for piano, electronics, and video which was something of a challenge because I never worked with video, but fine. Um, I like Jennifer's ideas. And so 
I, um, I had a video made from the stills of the piano transplants, the piano burning, the piano in the garden, the piano in the pond, and the piano on the beach, I think. No, we hadn't, we hadn't done the piano on the beach at that point, which are projected behind the piano. Um, and the piece then, and the electronics got unduly complicated because they start, um, as I recall, yeah, I, I initially asked for the, her voice when she's describing her hands to come from a speaker located underneath the piano. So it's coming from the area of the piano. But then when she starts talking about piano, she's owned the voice, which is uh, two transducers, which are placed on the, on the pins of the strings, some of the strings inside the piano. So they resonate the strings and they resonate the soundboard. And the piano is already coloring her voice. By this is the, the precise moment when she begins talking about the pianos, yeah? When the, the voice yeah. of her in, goes yeah. inside her piano. Yeah, yeah. it's as if the piano t swallows her voice. Yeah, it's a beautiful moment, beautiful moment. It's tricky to set up. It's really tricky yeah. to set up. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's unduly tricky. It makes the, the concept too complicated. It doesn't have to be that complicated. But mm. that the original version of the piece, I keep thinking I should make another more more doable, more practical version. <laughs> that, that's the original version of the piece. And also incorporated uh, is Stephen Scott's lovely practice of bowed piano. Hmm. Um, but I do it with, I do, um, I always get tripped up by specificities. Um, my local craft shop sells all sorts of ribbons, including ribbons which are, which have wire threaded through one edge. Yeah. And when you, Right when you pull those ribbons under the strings with the wire edge up against the strings, it's a most amazing sound. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Really. It's beautiful, right? And I can't always get those ribbons. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, ha I had uh, lots of problems with uh, getting this uh, this material uh, myself, and you had to send it to me like many years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I still I have kind of I have rolls of those rhythms to send to people <laughs> when necessary. <laughs> But it's worth it for the sound, yeah. I think. The sounds are lovely. And also visually, visually it's also beautiful to see because you have like different colors of uh, these ribbons yes. and yeah. they make it so beautiful when they just f uh, um, follow the, 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 the side of the piano. And you, yeah, they sort of drape over the side, originally red and yellow and green. Yeah. yeah. So and so you see them being see. pulled, as it were, through the air. Not quite under the strings, but it looks like they're being pulled through the air. Yeah, it's quite lovely. Yeah, the colors yeah, actually, are lovely. Actually, I had also a very beautiful experience with this piece with another student of mine, uh, Carmen Iriarte, which um, I think you had, you had also yeah. a recording of, of, of her playing. She made a beautiful yeah. um, a performance yeah. of this piece. And it's, um, it's a process that is um, so different to any other thing that you can do in the piano. I mean, like the first thing you have to do is just reflect on yourself, reflect on your hands and relation you, you have had with that. With, and with your pianos and at the beginning it always happened the same thing it's like what I am I'm, I'm going to say about my hands or about my pianos but then you begin writing and a lot of many wonderful uh, memories uh, yeah. begin to appear and then yeah. you build this structure of uh, memories of yours and then on the top of that when everything is recorded and processed and everything then you begin um, preparing the piece and mixing everything together it was a fantastic experience with Carmen preparing this piece this piece wonderful actually. Yeah, beautiful, so, beautiful. Mm. So it's a piece which any pianist can make their own. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you and I talked at one point about about the the uh, images from the piano transplants and that's right ways they might be done. Did you ever reconstruct that element? I tried to, but I didn't get to any final point. But I will do it for sure. I mean, and now that we are again talking about it, I will for sure do it. And I will also try if um, if we can do it together to do a um, an easy, more easy version for people to to, yeah. to build everything together. I mean, just in in terms of yeah. uh, the structure of the great. piece. Yeah, that, we have to do it. Yeah, because that Good would that. be super. I would I would love to work on that with you. Yeah, we will do so, it for sure. Fantastic. Terrific. Su tacto es de cera y la variedad del movimiento, casi eléctrico, provoca hipnosis natural, conocedoras del placer y del saber hacer. 
Las manos son un instrumento más sonado y menos sonado, porque lloran sin gemir y ríen sin vibrar, porque saben expresar aquello que mi mente no ha sido capaz con su instrumento natural. Y hacemos natural la contorsión del baile sobre el teclado, y normalizamos el milagro de la expresión sin palabras, a través de huesos y músculos que memorizan movimientos. Huesos y músculos. Las siento libres, aun formando parte de mí. Disfrutan de la intensidad del sentimiento más sufrido en el interior de su pequeña alma. So this, I think these are your pieces for, for piano. The, I think mm -hmm. you don't have any more thing. I, I read about, um, I, I'm, I'm sure it's not a piece for piano, but uh, I read about a piece that you have that may incorporate a, pr a piano pre prepared part inside of it. Do you recall which, which pieces it is? It's okay. a piece for other instruments where there is a prepared piano part inside of it and it is possible to integrate it inside of a piece or not. If I'm not I'm wrong, uh, I read it somewhere. I've, I've done I've done a few pieces for ensembles which incorporate piano. Yeah, yeah, it um, was for ensemble. Yeah, I did one for the um, Bangladesh Can Ensemble, uh, which of course incorporates a piano. I don't recall doing. There's some work inside the piano, not particularly uh, intricate work, as I recall. There's that. I recently. But where it really took flight was I recently did a, a, a flat out, a co-composed collaboration with the ensemble Yarn Wire. I wanted to talk about it, yeah. Yeah, two pianists, two percussionists. Into um, the vanishing point is called the piece, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Ning Yu and Laura Barger, the pianists, uh, live as much inside the piano as outside it. Very happy to be there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and the two percussionists, Russell Greenberg and Ian Antonio, uh, the four of them interface their sounds wonderfully. We just recorded that piece, which is called "Into the Vanishing Point." Mm -hmm. It's about. It's really about insect extinctions, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, we just recorded it for the Black Truffle label, so it's about to come out. Oh yeah. Um, and. They, the, putting that piece together, figuring it out and putting it together, all five of us, um, was just a joy. All s Laura produced sound, both of Laura and Ning produced sounds and tools for working inside the piano, which I'd never come across before, mm. wow. um, which was totally fascinating and, and, and quite amazing. Um, I think the most fascinating to me was the inner tube of a bicycle wheel. I know it, yeah. It's so Have amazing. you used it? <laughs> yeah, oh. many times. <laughs> this crazy sound. <laughs> it's fierce. I love yeah, yeah. it. I absolutely love it. Like brushing on the strings? Across yeah, the strings? Yeah. yeah, I'm getting the strings to scream. It's <laughs> really amazing. <laughs> yeah, my, my daughter is uh, 10 years old. She says it's like a fairy, fairy sound or something like, like that. Yeah. Oh, it depends on the intensity, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But working, working with all four of them was a total joy. Uh, yeah, and can imagine. Laura and Ning were <laughs> a, astonishing in what they conjure up from a piano. It was a lot of fun. So in terms of ensemble work, uh, that's the ensemble with which I've been able to go furthest. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of prepared piano yeah they just have it down <laughs> when, when could we, we hear the piece uh it's almost uh, let's see the covers all everything is designed everything's mastered um the it's a it's to be vinyl and online and i wouldn't be surprised if if copies uh, weren't available within a couple of months mm, wonderful it, It's a, it's a, so it's a vinyl album with my uh, collaboration with Nate Woolley, the trumpet player and composer, yeah, uh, which is that. also, yeah, also co-composed on one side, Becoming Air on one side and the collaboration with Jan Wire on the other side. Hmm. And then looking forward to it, they, they were well, very well recorded and they'd be beautifully mastered. So. Wow, fantastic.
And maybe my final questions, after having written so many wonderful pieces of the piano, do you fancy you imagine yourself writing again for it? In some you know, way or another? You have to buy a piano. <laughs> <laughs> First thing, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> the piano I have in the basement, which I dearly love, is impossible to work with because the things it will do, no other piano could possibly do. Wow, wow, that's a problem, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a problem. I mean, Sarah wants me to make a piece and Jennifer does and various various people every now and then ask me, try to persuade me, but I really would literally have to buy a piano. And yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen quite somehow. And did you have you ever imagined composing a, a piece of piano that merges also this other aspect of your music that is a field recording? Have you ever thought about about combining both things? Ha! Huh. No, mm. no, and it, and it's not that I'm I'm partic I'm precious about field recording. You know, I I don't feel it should be a thing unto itself only. Um, it just just has never occurred to me. I'm trying to think. Yes, I've done. I've, done, I've been working with what is now called field recording, but what I mm. used to call and still do environmental sounds mm. for so long. Mm. I mean, going back to Tiger Bomb, the first piece I made after I did the glass concerts. When was that? When, well, that was 1970. Wow. I mean, wow. from then, for me, it, it wasn't field recording. It was how m music concrete practices expanded. Mm. and took us into a world in which we could work with environmental sound as as much as with any other sound and m merge and mingle all these sound sources. So it was not something special. Mm -hmm. um, it was a natural part of one's toolkit, mm. you know. Yes. So environmental sounds have been popping up in my pieces all along, really. Mm. Um, if I think of the thinking of the term field recording, takes me more to things like the rivers, mm. the sound maps of the rivers, which yeah. are purely field recording. But mm. I just made a piece for Ruth. Um, if I may, I'll send it to you. It's not long. Um, mm. It incorporates it, it's, it incorporates our voices talking to each other mm. over the phone when we first met, wow. which Ruth recorded. <laughs> she tapped the phone. <laughs> I love to hear that. <laughs> and, and field recordings I made in the environment where she was living out mm. in New Hampshire in the woods, in New wow. Hampshire at the time. Mm. Um, and that, so they naturally belonged together. Mm. That, this was the place, this was the, these were the people, this is what we got up to. <laughs> well, um, I, will, I would love to listen to that if you send it to me. I'll, I'll send it to you, sure. It was mm. commissioned by Counter, Counterflows, the Glasgow Festival, oh, yeah. which, which will start on April 1st. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and you know this maybe last idea that I'm just throwing there <laughs> who knows whatever happens do you know what I constantly imagine that it would be wonderful in your hands um, collection of pieces small pieces for young children like for a p uh, young pianist experimenting Ooh. inside the <laughs> piano like my daughter my daughter is ten, uh, 10 years old and she loves experimenting the piano of course because of me and yes, she enjoys so much every <laughs> single thing that I just uh, show as a possibility. And I think this is something that you would do in such a wonderful way. <laughs> oh, just what a lovely in, idea. Just in but case then I sometimes it happens. But you know, it immediately brings me to the idea of, of your daughter. You're suggesting to your daughter that she make a set of pieces. Oh yeah, from the things she <laughs> loves to play with. I like that. I tell why you don't so. you ask her? Yeah, why don't wow. you suggest to her she make mm. she make that album? Oh, she's going to love it. She's going to love your idea. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do it. I'll try it. I will. I, I think, will tell you how it was. Oh great, great. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be the perfect way to do that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Nope. Thank you for the idea. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, Ricardo. And yes, uh, thank you so much for being here with me and talking about all these things. I truly, truly appreciate. Such a pleasure. For one thing, a great pleasure to be able to spend time with you in person again, more or less in person. Hopefully, hopefully yeah, hopefully we'll do it. Hopefully. We'll do it again soon. And thank you very much for all your... Thank you very much for all the growth you have given these pieces. Mm -hmm. you know? 
through championing him. Thank you so much. And it comes from from heart. It, it comes really from something, in some connection, deep connection in, inside with your music. That's mm. that's for sure. I mean, it's mm. the only reason. I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Anya. Uh, we'll stay in contact. And yes, absolutely. All the best. Yeah, and we'll see if we can we can uh, revise Susie so that it makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll to speak, so sure. it's performable. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, we'll do it for sure. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> and and have a good spring. May things get easier and easier. Yeah, hopefully so for you yeah. too. Yeah. Thank you. A big pleasure. Yeah, big pleasure. Thank you, Ricardo. Bye bye. Adios. Adios. <laughs> uh. Maybe. Uh huh. Mm hmm. So I guess now we go and do things. So can we do a take of Yes, we do. Oh, that's, that's very nice. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I like to be in there. <laughs> mm. And I got a letter from you. Really? Yes, I did. This. Very happy. Shall I answer your letter? How are you this morning? I'm very well. Are you? Thank you.
If you like the content of this channel and want to help us with it, follow the links below. Thanks a lot.